Prime Time Crimes presents this crime education video with two true crime stories. We suggest watching this video as if you are the victim in each story. While watching, identify the warning signs that led up to the incident and think about what would you do to prevent this from happening to you or to someone in your family. If we can learn from these videos, we will be educated instead of just entertained. I respond to all comments so please leave a comment on your observations. And finally, please consider subscribing to Prime Time Crimes if you like true crime stories. Thank you for supporting my channel. February 15th, 2010, Indy Atlantic, Florida. It's just after 9 p.m. as personal trainer Mark Knopf anxiously waits for his client, Kelly Brennan. Kelly had an appointment in the evening uh, with a personal trainer and then she didn't show up. She had never not shown up. That would be very out of character for Kelly. Mark went out to check the parking lot to see if her car was there and uh, couldn't find it and he said, hey, this is totally unlike her. She's always early. Worried, Mark begins calling to track Kelly down. It's not long before the news reaches her roommate, Stephanie Griffith. Stephanie Griffith, she last saw Kelly Brennan um, that morning at 6 a.m. Um, when Kelly was leaving for work. She hadn't spoken with her throughout the day. She was concerned because with Kelly, she always kept a regular schedule. No one's heard from her, and they get very worried at that point because... She always answers her phone. A little after 11 o'clock, um, Stephanie Griffith um, decided to call 911 to report her friend Kelly Brennan is missing. Deputies from the Brevard County Sheriff's Office arrive at Stephanie and Kelly's apartment at 11.21 p.m., hoping to get more information for their missing persons report. When Stephanie arrived home after getting off work at 9.30 that night, she did see that Kelly had taken her bicycle. Her scrubs that she had worn to work were in a hamper, so she knew she had come home to leave for the gym. Stephanie seemed to believe that this was extremely out of character and distressing because she was so punctual. So we get to the background to help us determine their activities, the people they may have been in contact with, where do they work, do they have any medical issues. Those are the types of things we're looking for. We were very on edge, wondering what, what happened to her. We were very worried about it. Born in 1963, Kelly Brennan grew up in New Jersey. With four sisters, Kelly had plenty of experience getting along with others. She had just a cute smile, and she was always pleasant, and people did. People loved Kelly, absolutely. Kelly had a lot of friends. Everybody that knew her, you know, would eventually become a friend. After graduating high school, Kelly dreamed of attending nursing school and took a job at a local seafood restaurant to pay her own way. She was a very hard worker, and she worked a couple jobs. We worked the four to midnight shift most of the time. After nursing school, Kelly set her sights on establishing a successful career. She worked as a nurse at the hospital, so had a job that was very physical and had a, a great compassion for people. Around the hospital, Kelly was known as a Sarge because of her work ethic. She would always push and strive to do better, and, and, and she would push others around her to do better. Outside of work, Kelly longed for love, and in 2003, she found it with an old friend named Gino Rollo. Kelly Brennan and Gino met while working at the restaurant. Gino was the manager of the restaurant she was working at to put herself through school. He was always a nice guy, easy to talk to, very, very awesome host. They started to grow intimate the more time they spent together. They started a relationship, eventually got married. Kelly and Gino seemed very happy. They would have the little get-togethers at their house, and it was always a good time and very happy, upbeat atmosphere. But a diagnosis Kelly had received in her early 30s sometimes took a toll. Kelly had MS. It affected her nervous system, and some days she'd be a little slow. She would move with difficulty and um, a little weak. She always looked very healthy, very fit. When I was told she had MS, I, I was shocked. Kelly refused to let the diagnosis control her life. When Kelly had the flare-ups, she would power through and keep going. She wasn't a quitter. That was something that was very inspiring. Kelly was a real advocate for MS. She would do bike rides for fundraisers to help raise money and awareness. Kelly also kept herself busy with friends who shared her passion for staying active, including 38-year-old Sheila Graham Trott. 
She moved here from Canada and was drawn here by the coastline and the surf and the water that we have. She was a diving instructor, and Brevard County is a great place for that. She was good enough to teach diving. She was very smart. I met both Kelly and Sheila at the same time. Kelly Brennan and Sheila and myself, we were all servers together in a restaurant. We closed together every night, and we were a tight-knit bunch. We became great friends and stayed friends. The restaurant industry also helped Sheila find the love of her life, Dan Trott. He's attractive, he's funny, and he's charming. And it's not hard to see why he, you know, could pick up girls. Dan dreamed of becoming a pilot. And when the couple married on August 26, 1989, Sheila worked nights and weekends to pay for Dan to go to flight school. I think that she looked at it like I'm a good wife and I'm supporting my husband and everything he does. Eventually, Sheila's hard work paid off. Dan became a pilot and the couple started a family. They had two kids, Graham and Creighton. She always took good care of the kids, made sure they had what they needed. And she was a good wife. She, you know, made dinner and poured a cocktail when Dan walked through the door. She worked in the restaurant business and she also did real estate at some point Dan and actually became involved in city politics and became the mayor of Indy Atlantic. I voted for him because I felt like I was voting for Sheila because Sheila was on top of everything. She knew everything going on in Indy Atlantic. While Sheila and Dan rose to prominence, they kept in touch with their old friends Kelly and Gino as much as possible. Kelly got into biking, wanted to be a triathlete. Sheila was into biking, and then both of their husbands got involved. The four of them started cycling together. They were all really great friends. But in 2009, one half of the cycling group hit a speed bump. Dan was cheating on Sheila. I'm sure that Sheila's heart was probably breaking, but she didn't make like it was. Sheila was, you know, she was loyal. She was a loyal wife and wanted to hold her marriage together. So she tried everything, but that didn't work for her. Finally, in March 2009, the couple started talking divorce, and Dan moved out of the family home. I do know the struggles that he put into Sheila's life. I know he, he did. He made her crazy because he did cheat on her. But Sheila and Dan weren't the only ones whose marriage had hit a breaking point. Things got bad with Gino and Kelly. All of a sudden, both marriages fall apart. It's an interesting little twist of people that were close friends. There had been some problems between Gino and her. Gino wanted to reconcile, but Kelly was pretty set on the fact that she wanted out of that relationship and to move on with her life. Kelly moved in with Stephanie. They were, you know, close people. And Kelly needed a place to go, and Stephanie had a, a place for her. But now, less than a year later, on February 15th, 2010, Kelly mysteriously goes missing. And investigators hope Stephanie can help them find her. She knows Kelly's activities pretty well on a day-to-day -day basis. She knows that Kelly left for work, but she hasn't seen her since in person. Kelly suffered from multiple sclerosis, and it is a disease that affects the central nervous system. We were worried with the history of the MS that she might be had a flare-up and she could have lost control of the car because of either weakness or a seizure or something like that. So we worried about that. Stephanie was so scared and, and worried that something may have happened to her. We were determined to find Kelly and hopefully to find her alive. Just before midnight on February 15th, 2010, Investigators with the Brevard County Sheriff's Office are on a desperate search for 46-year-old Kelly Brennan, who suffers from MS. We began investigating that night because of the fact that she could be an endangered person because of her medical condition. She may have had an episode while driving to her gym appointment, maybe was involved in a car crash, maybe was transported to a hospital. At that point in time, you just check local hospitals. Hey, has somebody come into your emergency room like that? We sent a bolo out be on the lookout to other agencies with the tag information and attempt to locate the vehicle. After having no luck locating Kelly, deputies head to her gym to speak with her personal trainer, Mark Knopf. 
Mark says that although Kelly never showed up, someone else did. It was probably about 9.30. He actually saw Dan Trot arrive. And Dan was also concerned when personal trainer said that she hadn't arrived for the gym. Mark does tell us that originally Kelly worked out with her soon-to-be ex-husband, Gino. And recently, he had noticed that she was working out with Dan all the time. So his thought process on that was that there must be some kind of a little more than a friend relationship going on. As the sun rises on February 16th, detectives fan out in search of Dan. But before they track him down, dispatch receives an odd call from his mother-in-law. About 7.30 the next morning, Indian Lake Police Department gets a 911 call from Margaret Byers, who is the mother of Sheila Trott, and calls and says, you need to come out here. My daughter I, has had a nervous breakdown. I mean, is she distraught? Is she angry? Everything. Margaret says her daughter can't stop rambling on about one of her friends. She was calling out. She sees Kelly's face. Kelly's been her. She provides him with the name of the person, Kelly Brennan. Fearing their missing persons case may be turning into something more sinister, the Brevard County Sheriff's Office immediately responds to Sheila's home. She doesn't know that we have a missing person report. It's not been broadcast to the news. As we respond, we're looking at the fact that Sheila's Dan's soon-to-be ex-wife. Dan may be Kelly Brennan, our missing person's boyfriend. We start to treat it as, okay, this we need to get serious now. We need to look deeper into this. When officers arrive at the home, Sheila's mother, Margaret, and teenage sons, Graham and Creighton, confront them with a bizarre story about the previous evening. It was almost 10, and I came in from doing laundry and saw her standing in the doorway, holding on to one of our shelves in the living room, and then onto the door frame. And she was sitting there, like, just kind of shaking. I said, Mom, are you okay? She said, I'm really dizzy, really dizzy. And then she, like, went back against the wall and then just started having a seizure. Sheila's son says the event was so alarming, he had actually called 911 himself at 11.07 p.m. on February 15th, the same night Kelly went missing. Uh, I think my mom's having a seizure. She's just shaking and freaking out. She can't really talk right now. She can't move right. She was just shaking. All right, we're going to get some help on the way to her, okay, Graham? Okay, thank you. She goes to the hospital. They run a series of tests. They find nothing medically wrong at that point, and so she's released to come home. We came back home by like 2.30, and then at about 4 o'clock in the morning, I heard her calling me, and I went into her room, and she was still like out of it, and she was like, Graham, Graham, and I was like, what? She's like, I keep having this same dream over and over again. I keep seeing her face, like she saw Kelly's face and whatever. At that point, the kids called grandmother to get some assistance. When I got here, I talked to her. What did uh, your daughter tell you? She's having dreams and she keeps seeing Kelly said there's, there's something wrong. The grandmother had concern enough that she actually called 911 to report that Kelly was possibly hurt. After speaking with her family, the officer heads upstairs to talk with Sheila. So when we're in the room talking to her, obviously it was kind of, you know, strange. She was in bed. She wouldn't get out of bed. Can you tell me anything at all? about your dream. Anything that might help us locate Kelly. She could very well be okay. We don't know. I don't don't know either. Like I said, it's just I don't remember. She said I was repeating myself or something. She seems to have had some type of mental break, and yet she's had this dream where she's seeing a face that's of a person named Kelly that either she may have hurt or someone may have hurt or someone may have killed during an argument. Sheila insists her friend Kelly Brennan is in danger, and she soon reveals a clue as to where. She kept saying, I see Mark's landing. She's hurt. She's at Mark's landing. Mark Landing is pretty much like a residential area um, of homes located um, pretty far down in the south end of Melbourne Beach. And unless you live in Bavard County, um, you're probably not likely to come across it. There's very few houses that are actually on the beach because of the way the dune lines. The first reaction that we have when we hear some of these things is we need to send people to Mark Landing. I would give it probably a zero percent that she can come up with those specifics out of a dream and not be involved in some form or fashion. This is not out in the papers. This is the next morning. This is overnight. So she wouldn't know it officially. 
Investigators quickly dispatch a team to Mark's Landing, the location where Sheila believes Kelly may be in danger. She didn't give a particular location of exactly where we could find Kelly. We sent several units to do a search of the area, both in cars and on foot. During that search, they determined that the dunes themselves were heavily vegetated. When the police initially went there, they initially couldn't find her. So at that point, we requested a helicopter to give us a better aerial search view. Well, almost immediately upon arrival of our star helicopter, the pilots noticed the body. Once our crime scene investigators and, and everything get there and, and take a closer look, she's wearing athletic attire. The first officer, based on the clothing description and the pictures that he has, he's confident that this is Kelly Brennan. February 16th, 2010. Detectives investigating the disappearance of Kelly Brennan have just located her body in Mark's Landing, the area where her friend Sheila Graham Trot thought she might be hurt. You could tell she had a lot of blunt force trauma to the head area. Her hair was kind of matted and covering her face um, from the blood. It was kind of a gruesome scene. It didn't look like she had been there a very long time, but possibly had been there overnight. It did not look like there was a spree attack or some kind of blitz attack that occurred right there. There would have been a tremendous amount of blood on the scene. There would have been evidence of a large struggle and those types of things. They weren't present. There appeared to be some type of a drag mark through the sand leading up into that area where we finally located her body. That was a telltale sign that this happened somewhere else. Somebody brought her to this location. While Kelly's body is transferred for an autopsy, detectives are left with a pressing question. How did Sheila know that Kelly's body was on the beach? I've worked cases when I was in special victims where we've had psychics call us and tell us about, you know, visions they've seen. But here was a woman telling us about a dream about a particular friend and a particular incident in a particular location. It doesn't seem plausible at all. The fact that she's seeing Kelly's face tells me that, you know, she was there when it happened. The only way somebody would know where the body was if they put it there. If she didn't do it, she was there when it was done or knows a lot about it. Detectives return to Sheila's home and turn their attention to Dan Trott, Sheila's soon-to-be ex-husband and Kelly's possible boyfriend. Once we found Kelly Brandon's body, Dan Trott had responded to Sheila's house And while he was there is when he was interviewed by one of the agents from the homicide unit. Detectives questioned Dan about his contact with Kelly the evening she was reported missing. When's the last time that you seen Kelly, spoke to Kelly? The last time I spoke to her was last night about 6.30. I was in Atlanta. My flight was supposed to leave about 7, so I'd be in about 8.20, 8.30 in the Melbourne here. And she was in Central Avenue last night. So I said, I'll get you to the gym. Trot and his wife had been separated for almost a year during this time. And during their separation, he developed this relationship with Kelly Brandon. Their relationship got more intimate. And this relationship she has with Dan Trot is growing. Dan says that in early 2009, he and Sheila filed for divorce. He did not live at home with his soon-to-be ex-wife. He actually had a residence somewhere else. And he had started in a relationship with Kelly According to Dan, the relationship wasn't well received by his ex. She's been stalking him in respect. Yes, most of this, she's clever. She's capable. Dan claims Sheila wasn't the only jealous spouse in the mix. Kelly had been married to Gino. They were still legally married, but she had moved on and was now seeing Dan. Gino, I don't think, knew that. But, Dan says, on Christmas Eve 2009, Gino somehow found out about Kelly's new flame. Gino burst into the residence. Obviously, he was upset, and he had a blunt object that he was able to use and hit Dan Trot about the head. Kelly is begging him to stop, you know, telling him to quit, to leave. And at some point, she says she's calling the police or they actually dial 911. And Gino runs off and, and hides from the uh, police response. Dan says after Gino left him bruised on the floor, he thought everything was over. But he was wrong. Kelly went back to the house that night. She went back to Gino's house. 
She confronts Gino about the incident that happened with Dan. They get into an argument. Gino's upset. He ends up putting his hands on Kelly. She ends up calling 911. Law enforcement arrives, but no one was arrested. And Kelly left. Dan claims that when Kelly quickly filed for divorce, Gino felt Dan was stealing his wife. He was calling Dan, just leaving messages, um, threatening him about the whole incident. Sorry, while Dan's insight casts heavy suspicion on Gino, detectives must clear Dan as a suspect first. Dan Trott was an airline pilot for one of the local airlines, and he was on duty that day. Dan had spoke with Kelly at 6.30, and he still had not flown into um, or arrived in Bavard County. The timeline of him between that time and actually arriving at the gym at 9.30 didn't give him the ability to come back to Melbourne, commit this crime, be able to drive all the way down to Mark's Landing. It would be at least 45 minutes from the gym to get down there to Mark's Landing. Be able to confirm actual times and, and lock in his time frame of alibi to, uh, to show that he wasn't able to commit this crime. After clearing Dan, investigators set their sights on Gino Rollo. There's plenty of reasons to look at Gino as far as being a person that could possibly hurt her. And so we have to take that seriously and look at him. Detectives become even more focused on Gino when the medical examiner reveals the results of Kelly's autopsy. There was multiple, multiple blows to the head. No observable defensive wounds whatsoever, which suggests that the initial blow came from behind and incapacitated her. There was blunt force trauma, and their most likely object was that it was possibly a hammer. They did say tire is a possibility. Some of them were so brutal and with force that it completely cracked the skull and left actual holes in the skull. You can tell by looking at injuries, this is personal. She was beaten until the person couldn't beat anymore. Detectives can't help but notice the similarities between Kelly's cause of death and Gino's attack on Dan a few weeks earlier. My first thought was Gino must have killed Kelly. That was my first thought. Detectives rush to meet Gino at the home he used to share with Kelly. He was very cautiously cooperative. I think uh, partly due to he probably figured he was a suspect. Of course, that makes you very apprehensive, talking to the police, not wanting to say the wrong thing. Her separation occurred because uh, she was hanging out with Daniel Trott. And, uh, you know, was a friend of ours. She's been a guest of my home here multiple times. Gino says he initially found out about his wife's infidelity from a friend whose name is all too familiar to investigators. Gino told us that he'd been receiving information from Sheila Trot about his wife's relationship with Dan Trot. She'd written a lot of letters, you know, Gino, Kelly's cheating on you with Dan. And, like, I remember one letter Gino even writing back, you're crazy, leave me alone. He never really looked into or tried to find out if there was this relationship. According to Gino, he refused to believe the rumor about his wife and Dan until one night in December of 2009. Sheila gave the information to Gino and just kind of left it as, if you don't believe me, you know, go check for yourself. Gino was overcome with curiosity, so he drove to the residence. Okay, the altercation happened at Dan's house. Was that your phone was that? Yes. Gino um, found out about the relationship, and it was shortly after this incident, Kelly decided to move out of the residence, um, and she moved in with Stephanie. Gino says that though his jealousy got the best of him then, he is not responsible for Kelly's death, and he can prove it. I was working in Orlando yesterday. We were opening a new restaurant just uh, north of the airport. Coming back to town... He stopped at a couple of different businesses that we could time date stamp. I picked up a prescription. I had called in a few days before at Walgreens at the corner here. The last time she was known to be alive was when she talked with her estranged husband, Gino, at about 7 o'clock. She was supposed to have been meeting her trainer at approximately 9 o'clock. So it's very likely 
that the murder occurred sometime between those points in time. Police were able to go to that drugstore and find him on the store surveillance camera at the time he claimed to have been there. That store video was the conclusive evidence that he couldn't have done it. With Kelly's current and former lovers seemingly in the clear, one suspect remains. And now we've got Sheila, number one on the list. Detectives investigating the brutal murder of Kelly Brennan have zeroed in on her friend Sheila Graham Trott as their prime suspect. We did try to reestablish contact with, with Sheila and her boys to conduct additional interviews, but at that point they were no longer willing to speak with us. With Sheila no longer cooperating, investigators now shift focus to where Kelly was actually killed. The last place that we could figure she must have been uh, would have been at Stephanie's house. Investigators go back to the house again to take a look. Stephanie's house, it's several miles from the dump site. She has trees that border her front yard along the roadway. Right off the bat, we noticed there was tire marks leading into the grass. There was like a matted area of the grass where it looked like somebody had sprayed a bunch of water. There are divots in the ground from where it appeared to be like a hammer striking and hitting into the dirt. That would strongly suggest that this is where the crime occurred. Hard to come up with another reasonable explanation of that. Down the street, patrol officers make another discovery. Kelly's car was found abandoned in a parking lot of a uh, condo complex a few miles away. There was a large amount of blood in the passenger side floorboard of the vehicle. With the discovery of Kelly's vehicle, detectives finally have a theory about what happened on February 15th. I believe she made it home from work. I believe she changed. She loaded her bicycle in the back of her vehicle. I think at some point she was walking back in the house and her attacker came up from behind her struck her with the first blow, which put her down, and she didn't have a fighting chance. The tire tracks at that point assumed to be Kelly's vehicle being pulled into the yard so that the attacker could place her into the vehicle. This isn't just an accidental shooting or anything like that. This was a brutal personal attack on another human being. Detectives canvass the neighborhood and find one neighbor who remembers seeing something unusual on February 15th. About 8.30 that night, he described a light-colored or white vehicle, and Sheila has a white vehicle. According to the neighbor, he also saw a woman standing in the yard. The neighbor, who saw someone out in the front yard at approximately 8.30, described that person as having blonde hair, which... Miss Graham Trot does, and then you have her story to the police. I had a dream about all this. We did a search warrant at Sheila's residence. We seized her vehicle, and one of the pieces of evidence that we had recovered from the vehicle was blood spatter that was found on the passenger side of her vehicle. That piece of evidence happened to be the blood of Kelly Brennan. Overall, the, the evidence that we had, everything led to Sheila. On February 17, 2010, a judge issues a warrant for Sheila's arrest on the charges of first-degree murder. They, like, got her in a corner and came from all directions and, and pulled the car over. At that point, she had nothing to say to us. She didn't ask any questions. She didn't ask why we were arresting her. Um, she just remained quiet. As the trial approaches, prosecutors make one final attempt to extract information from Sheila's sons. For a couple of years there, there was really not much to do but wait and be prepared for trial. But at some point prior to the trial, the state attorney's office subpoenaed the two boys, Sheila's sons, and although they were represented by an attorney, they were given an opportunity to provide depositions to the state. The boy's lawyer agrees on one condition. I was not going to allow them to testify unless there was immunity given. Prosecutors agreed to grant Sheila's sons full immunity. On August 26, 2014, four and a half years since the murder of Kelly Brennan, the boys, now aged 21 and 23, finally open up about their home life and mother. During those depositions, they provide information that 
Dan is the one pushing for the divorce. And although they were going through a divorce, I don't think she really wanted the divorce. I believe that the boys had to take care of their mother a lot. I'm sure that there were a lot of episodes where the mother was hysterical and crying over this divorce. The boys tell prosecutors that once their father began dating Kelly, their mother's behavior became more erratic. Deep down, I think she still loved Dan, and she blamed Kelly for taking Dan away from her. I had been getting weird texts from her, so she wasn't herself. On the night of February 15th, 2010, the boys say their mother had spent the day repainting their home when she suddenly said she had to go to Walmart and didn't return home until 11 p.m. We have now these four and a half hours that fit into that time frame of would she be able to commit a murder, take someone to Mark's Landing and come back home? And she has the time to do it. She returns home pretty much empty handed. She's wearing different clothing. The mother was acting completely unhinged and unmanageable. She did tell the boys that she thought that that she killed Kelly. And Graham said to her, that's crazy, you didn't kill Kelly. And she said, no, I did. He said, then where's the body? And she told them, Mark's Landing. So I don't know which one of the kids it was, but they said, fine, then let's go show us. So they drove down to Mark's Landing and she'll show them Kelly's body. What the sons we're confronted with now is, mom says this was a dream, but guess what? It isn't a dream. So the thought that the kids saw that up and in real life makes me sick to my stomach. In September of 2014, Sheila Graham Trott is given a choice. Force her two sons to endure testifying against her or take a plea bargain. That plea bargain would have avoided her children having to testify. So... If anyone's ever testified in court, that's pretty traumatic. And so Miss Trott could have avoided that for her children, and she chose not to. Sheila shouldn't have put her kids through all this. She should have stepped up to the plate, and she should have told the truth. Instead, Sheila doubles down on her innocence. On September 3rd, 2014, prosecutors receive a letter Sheila wrote to her friend, Kim Meredith. While she was sitting in the county jail, she wrote an extensive letter. And in that letter, she said, oh, my memory has come back to me. It turns out that this was not a dream, that I actually saw Kelly get murdered. In the letter, Sheila claims she had gone over to Kelly's house that night to talk to her about Dan. She was the kind of person that's like, I'm going to go confront her. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to her. She said, I parked around the corner, and I walked around, and I saw somebody having a confrontation with her. Sheila claims it was too dark to see who the other person was, but she could tell when the man attacked Kelly. It had every blow to the head. It had all this description. She said, I saw her get killed out in her front yard, and then I saw the killer load her body into her vehicle and drive her to where it was found and I followed him there prosecutors believe that Sheila is actually describing how she carried out Kelly's murder my view of the letter that Sheila wrote when I read it is it's a confession it has so much detail uh, as far as actions that were taken it doesn't make sense that you would watch a crime like this be committed and then follow the person around and not call the police Undeterred by Sheila's letter, the trial begins in September of 2014. In their opening arguments, prosecutors tell the jury they believe Sheila first tried to get Kelly's husband, Gino, to end the affair for her. Sheila figured since she wasn't reaching Dan, that by letting Gino know of this relationship, it would cause a disturbance on that side of the relationship that might be able to pull Kelly away from Dan. When that failed, prosecutors insist Sheila took matters into her own hands. So my, my belief is that originally she probably went there to confront her. And I think with all the anger that she had built up, that it was a crime of opportunity. Sheila came up behind her, put her down, and just continued to beat her out of anger. She then loaded Kelly's body into Kelly's car, drove her to where she disposed the body, then disposed of, then abandoned Kelly's car. 
Sheila was a classic example of someone that let jealousy control her and her and she just uh, just snapped. While prosecutors rely on the testimony of Sheila's sons to secure their case, Sheila's defense insists there are other people who wanted Kelly dead. Her attorneys were trying to lean in to create that reasonable doubt by presenting as much as they could about Gino. But will the jury believe it? This is a straightforward case. The verdict came back guilty. There was just too much evidence. She looked at me a couple times, no emotion. She didn't cry. She, she didn't, there was no emotion. On September 16th, 2014, Sheila is sentenced to life in prison for first-degree premeditated murder. I think she's clearly where she belongs. She killed somebody. Um, she did it in a very brutal fashion. I believe that when you behave in a manner that Sheila Trott did, that the only answer is life in prison. To those close to the case, it's a reminder of just how consuming jealousy can be. She thought Kelly absolutely betrayed her, and Kelly did betray her, but she didn't deserve to die. Something like this is pure anger and revenge, and that is the brutality of it all. And I think that's when people say somebody's evil, that's what evil is. Oakland, California, a city in the Bay Area well known for its acceptance and diversity. But in the late 1990s, drugs had flooded the streets of this once proud community. In the 90s, we had a very large epidemic of shootings. The city had a lot of gang activity going on, a lot of drug activity going on. Oakland is a beautiful city, especially around Lake Merritt. But Oakland could be like any other big city. You have your ins, your outs, your ups and downs, and your good and your bad. And on the evening of July 1st, 1997, East Oakland resident Monica Boyette gets a glimpse of the bad when she hears a frantic knock at her door. A lady came uh, to my door and told me that she needed help. Monica recognizes the woman as one of the Allman sisters who live nearby. I could not tell which one of the sisters it was. She was burnt really bad. She said someone threw something in her window. That's when Monica looks down the street to see the woman's home ablaze. You could hear people, it's a fire. It's a fire, people were saying that. The house was fully in flames when the uh, fire department arrived. I came home from work and I noticed a bunch of fire trucks out there and the home was engulfed in flames. It was completely torched. There would not have even been an attempt to go into the house to try and save anyone because it was so fully engulfed in flames. As firefighters rush to extinguish the inferno, paramedics tend to the woman's wounds. She had first and second degree, what they say are deflective burns on her hands, her arms, and her legs. I don't believe they concluded that there were any life-threatening injuries, but that she did need immediate medical attention. The woman identifies herself to first responders as 52-year-old Stevie Ullman, the owner of the home that she shares with her sister, 47-year-old Sarah Mitchell. Stevie stuns authorities when she claims the fire was the result of drug dealers throwing firebombs through her window. She alleged that several individuals uh, surrounded the house and firebombed the house. The assumption was that drug dealers had, had attempted to burn her out of the house. All police know is that Stevie Allman has been injured, but we don't know why drug dealers would want to attack her. First responders attempt to calm Stevie down as she is loaded into the ambulance. But just as the doors close, surrounding neighbors make a terrifying realization. We were all in shock. Someone was asking um, the lady that came to my home, where is your sister? Where is your sister? Stevie says her sister Sarah is in a different state and had only recently moved out. As the ambulance pulls away, the Allman sisters' childhood home is left in ashes. California natives Sarah and Stevie Allman moved to Oakland, California at a young age with their mother and seven siblings. They had been in Oakland since the 1950s and grew up in that house that they were living in. 
With her father out of the picture, Stevie was tasked with helping her older sister Leota look after their younger siblings, including Sarah. The girls grew up in a environment where there's a single parent. The father disappeared and that their mom raised them. So the kids were relied on a lot to help out everybody else. And that Stevie was one of those people that was relied on at an early age to help out the family. There was a special bond between Stevie and her sister, who is five years her junior. Her name is Sarah. It wasn't uncommon for people to mistake them for twins. Though she always looked up to Stevie, Sarah quickly became accustomed to walking in her older sister's shadow. Stevie was a very sweet person, one of the absolute rocks of that family. By the early 1970s, the Almond children had left the nest, with the exception of Stevie. Stevie stays in the home with her mother, and she has a good job working for a local family business. Stevie Almond was known to be very industrious, a uh, very hard worker, and this was a company that made utility trucks, and Stevie was one of that family's most valuable employees. After nearly 20 years with the company, Stevie's dedication was recognized with a sizable bonus. Stevie Amon was one of the two employees that they gave over $100,000 to as part of her reward and her having been such a hardworking, dependable employee. While the other Almond children had established lives of their own, Stevie and Sarah remained close, proving that even with family, opposites attract. Even though Stevie and Sarah were very close and looked alike, that's about where it ends in terms of their individual characters. Stevie was the hard worker. She was grounded. She was employed. Whereas Sarah lived a more frivolous lifestyle, did not hold down jobs. By her 30s, Sarah found herself divorced with three young kids and a new last name, Mitchell. Sarah would meet a man, move in with him, live with the man, and it would fall apart. And then she'd wind up back living with Stevie and her mother. In the early 90s, Stevie and her mother welcomed Sarah and her kids back with open arms. The kind of arrangement that they had was that Stevie worked at her company, and Sarah, who did not work, was responsible for keeping the house clean and doing all the cooking. After a few years, Sarah's kids grew up and moved out while she remained with her sister and mother. Then, in 1994, the matriarch of the family passed away and left the home to her children. Once Stevie and Sarah's mother died, there was a big decision to make what to do with that beloved home that they lived in. It was bought by their mother, had so many memories. Stevie could not stand to part with it, so she bought it outright. Stevie agreed to pay her siblings for their shares of the home and became the sole owner, and she allowed Sarah to remain in the house. But while the house hadn't changed much, the city of Oakland had. Mid to late 90s, Oakland was basically crime infested with uh, with a lot of drug dealers. Uh, drugs were cheap then, and so crime was pretty rampant. There was a lot of drug wars going on and uh, other crimes related to drugs, burglaries, carjackings, robberies, homicides, everything. That's when the two sisters decided they would no longer be passive observers. Officers that were community policing officers worked closely with the community to solve neighborhood crimes. So we asked the residents to be our partners in this. They were our eyes and ears for the Oakland Police Department. But on July 1st, 1997, it seems the sisters' noble efforts to protect the neighborhood may have put them in the line of fire. Firefighters have just extinguished a massive fire at the East Oakland home of Stevie Allman and Sarah Mitchell. The framework of the house was still existing, but for the most part, the fire was extensive. The homeowner, 52-year-old Stevie Allman, has been transported to the hospital with multiple burns. Stevie claimed that the home had been firebombed by drug dealers, retaliating for Stevie filming their illegal activities for police. Stevie said that her intentions were to have them arrested and they would be out of the neighborhood and the neighborhood would be peaceful again. 
She said there were hooded individuals running into the yard. We're looking for three to four individuals. On July 1st, 1997, a fire has destroyed the childhood home of Stevie Allman and Sarah Mitchell. With Sarah currently unaccounted for, Oakland arson investigators are speaking to Stevie, hoping to find out who targeted their home. This case has now gone to the arson unit, and the first thing they want to do is go to the hospital and get a statement from their victim, Stevie. Stevie's theory is that local drug dealers attacked her home. She responded that drug dealers firebombed the house and threw Molotov cocktails into the house and um, that she ran through the front door uh, and suffered uh, burn injuries to her arms and legs. She was filming dope deals and uh, prostitution and from my understanding, she wanted to try to put an end to it. What she saw, she reported to the Oakland Police Department. Stevie says she recognized the men that threw Molotov cocktails as the same men she videotaped dealing drugs. Stevie goes on to explain that once the drug dealers discovered they were being filmed, they began threatening the Allman sisters. Stevie reveals to police that actually she and her sister had received several threats over the last couple of months. Stevie told the officers that Sarah had become frightened at the threats that they were receiving from the drug dealers and that she had moved out and no longer wanted to live there out of fear of being retaliated against. She indicated that Sarah had moved to Sparks, Nevada with her new boyfriend. According to Stevie, not long after Sarah left, the drug dealers made good on their threats. Now that detectives have heard Stevie's account, they asked for Sarah's contact information to hear her version of events. We were trying to contact her to piece together some of the details that we were finding a little confusing. They inquired, could Stevie give them the phone number to call Sarah? Stevie said her uh, address book had been burned in the fire. Armed with only Stevie's statement for now, Detectives begin their search for the alleged arsonists. We were looking for individuals in black hooded attire, you know, that had set the house on fire. I notified all the beat officers out there to start giving me identifications of all known dope dealers in the area. On July 3rd, the hospital releases a statement to the press on Stevie's behalf. In the statement, Stevie said that her intentions in filming these people were to get them out of the, to have them arrested and they would be out of the neighborhood, and the neighborhood would be peaceful again. The meat of it was essentially her role in the community and neighborhood watch and being careful as members of the community and not wanting um, the bad guys, if you will, to take over. And she was tired of it. The community was just very distraught, very upset, very concerned, and I believe they rallied together quite well to um, support her. She started getting donations, and people asked if they could donate money, and so we managed the processing of any monetary gifts that came through to her. The story had blown up into a national story to the point where Stevie Allman was receiving phone calls from the White House and the drug czar. And so the pressure on the Oakland Police Department to uh, solve the case was tremendous. To aid in the efforts, the governor of California offers a $50,000 reward for anyone with information on the arsonists to come forward. There was a lot of high activity on our part from law enforcement to uh, pick these people up for warrants. If they see them doing a deal in the street, they'd get picked up for uh, for sales of uh, narcotics. I think the majority of the drug dealers that they spoke to uh, didn't even know what the Oakland Police Department was talking about when they asked about videotapes. They were matter-of-factly about it. Said if she ever got in the way of our business or she ever caused us problems... Uh, it was easier to just put a bullet in her head as opposed to taking the chance of getting hurt or injured with a fireball. While the alleged dealers acknowledge they're not above violent retribution, they insist they know nothing about the fire. 
that, quite frankly, is unusual because normally someone is going to tell us something. But in this case, with a with a high dollar reward, with a lot of national attention on this case, we're getting no information, which to me means we're we're not turning up the right stone. Detectives turn back to the arson report, looking for any evidence they may have missed. They found several items that were inconsistent with the house or the room being firebombed. There was glass on the outside of the the house as opposed to the inside, which was inconsistent with the statement that a Molotov cocktail was thrown inside. Detectives begin to think that the arsonist was not a drug dealer at all but perhaps someone who held animosity towards the Allman sisters. Getting back in touch with Stevie Allman could be the key to finding out what happened. However, in the week following the fire, they struggled to connect with her or her sister, Sarah Mitchell. Nobody knew where the other sister was at. Nobody knew where Sarah was at. And that was something I was going to have to find out from Stevie. A number of times I tried to speak to her, but each time I went up to the hospital... Doctors were telling me uh, she's been sedated, uh, she couldn't speak. There was all kind of circumstances which meant that I couldn't get to Stevie and talk to her myself. With Stevie on tight medical supervision, detectives are forced to wait for information. But on July 7th, 1997, they receive surprising news from the Santa Cruz Police Department. Leota, a sibling of Stevie Amon, had filed a missing persons report on Stevie Amon. They said, well, why is she filing a missing persons report on Stevie Amon and Stevie Amon's in the hospital? Oakland detectives head to Santa Cruz to inform Stevie and Sarah's sister, Leota Belleville, about what's transpired. And they are met with a shocking accusation. The first thing Leota told the detectives was that the person in the hospital is not Stevie Amon. And that is Sarah Mitchell. It's been one week since the home of Stevie Allman was set ablaze. And detectives have just learned the woman they thought was Stevie may actually be Stevie's sister, Sarah Mitchell. The spotlight shifts now to this person that was in the hospital that is supposed to be the anti-drug crusader who is now not the person she says she is. Stevie and Sarah's older sister, Leota Belleville, says she immediately knew something was amiss when she saw the fire on the news and reports were dubbing Stevie a crime crusader. Stevie would never have drug dealers. She wouldn't have even acknowledged them. She would have just looked the other way. She wouldn't do anything. Leota told us that it was not Stevie Alma that was in the hospital, but it was in fact Sarah. Leota says she received a phone call from Sarah while she was in the hospital and that Sarah had a believable reason for posing as Stevie. Sarah didn't have any insurance that Stevie did, and so she was going to use Stevie's name and let the insurance pay for it. Leota goes on to share a disturbing premonition she had about Stevie. I wanted to know where Stevie was. Why did you want to know where Stevie was? Because weeks before, I'd had a terrible feeling that something very bad was going to happen to Stevie. I mean, I thought she was going to be dead, and I wanted to know where she was. I just asked Sarah over and over. Sarah Mitchell responded, Stevie's in Lake Tahoe. And a little bit later in the conversation, the sister asked Sarah Mitchell a second time, but where's Stevie? And Sarah responded that Stevie's in Reno. I said, something's wrong here. And I said to her, you told me Stevie was in Tahoe, and now you're saying she's in Reno. I want to know where Stevie is. At that point, Sarah Mitchell basically ended the conversation with her sister. Given Stevie and Sarah's relationship over the last few years, Leota fears something terrible has happened. Stevie had been long frustrated by Sarah being lazy, not willing to work, always looking for someone to take care of her, and just not being a real productive person. And that was at the heart of the bad blood that had been going on between Stevie and Sarah. When their mother died, Leota says the relationship between Stevie and Sarah only grew more fraught when Sarah began impersonating Stevie and cashing her checks. 
I know that it's happened several times where Sarah has pretended to be Stevie. Stevie still allowed Sarah to live there with her in that house, and I don't know why. Leota says Stevie had recently expressed interest in leaving Oakland, which only caused further friction between her two sisters. Stevie began having discussions about wanting to sell her house and go somewhere to retire. And then Sarah, of course, questioned, well, if you sell the house, what's going to happen to me? And Stevie, of course, responded that she was not responsible for taking care of Sarah for the rest of her life. Armed with this new information, detectives call the hospital for an immediate interview with the woman claiming to be Stevie Allman. I found out from the hospital itself that she had been released. So they did an all-points bulletin on finding her, and they eventually found her in the city uh, right next door to Oakland. And she was in a hotel in the city of Alameda. They brought her in for questioning. For the purpose of this interview, we see that now we're tape recording it, and that uh, we need to get your full name. My full name? For purpose of, yeah. Stevie Bio. The woman claiming to be Stevie sticks to her original story, but detectives aren't convinced. The first thing I noticed was the burns on the front of her arms, the front of her legs, uh, but it was only on the front, meaning to me that she was well aware of where the fire was at. She wasn't engulfed in the fire. Okay, now there were definitely somebody in the front yard, somebody in the backyard. There may have been three. But I believe there were four because of the way everything hit at one time. Detectives change course and press the woman about Leota's allegations. We received a report from Scotts Valley PD. Yeah, it's in regards to a missing person, and it was initiated by Leota Belvin. No, Leota knows better. She just was hysterical that night. She's the oldest. She's got some problems. She was adamant that she was Stevie Allman and that her sister Leota uh, never knew what she was talking about. In the past, have you ever assumed Stevie's identity at any time or have you ever assumed Sarah's identity? Has there any confusion? People will call me Sarah. People will call me Stevie, Miss Allman. That's about as far as assuming anything. You're not Sarah? No, I'm Stevie. Detectives ask for identification. As she opens up her purse, investigators spot two sets of IDs. She had a lot of identification on her that belonged to Sarah. And she had Stevie Ullman's identification on her. So at that point, I'm also confused as to who I'm talking to, whether I'm talking to Stevie or Sarah. Plus, she had also a lot of checks in her purse of donations that were written to Stevie Ullman. Police obviously ask her, why do you have two sets of identification? She said that they often carry each other's identification, which made no sense to me. And as much as she said that Sarah was off with her boyfriend in Nevada, meaning doesn't she need that identification for her own self? It reached a point in the interview and it became clear to the detectives that she was never going to admit that she was Sarah Mitchell. What we're probably going to do, Stevie, is just uh, for all intents and purposes, and just to clear it up, we're just going to have you fingerprint. Just roll the fingerprint. Okay. I told her that we'd like to get her fingerprinted so that I could find out who I'm talking to. At that point, she didn't really want to talk much anymore. It only takes police 45 minutes to receive the fingerprint match results and determine which Almond sister is sitting in front of them. The fingerprint return said that she was Sarah Mitchell. Oakland detectives have just determined that 47-year-old Sarah Mitchell has been posing as her sister, Stevie Allman, prompting the question, if this is Sarah, where is Stevie? She was very nervous when we came back into the room and approached her about knowing that she was Sarah. She denied it. She completely shut down. She wouldn't answer any questions, and all questioning stopped once she demanded a lawyer. At that point, Sergeant Hughes arrested her for forgery. With 
with Sarah in a cell and an APB out for the real Stevie Ullman, detectives hold Sarah Mitchell on charges of forgery and providing a false name to police. They went and looked at Stevie Ullman's bank accounts. And what they found was that all of the bank accounts had been cleaned out. So they wanted the video of those uh, transactions. And on every single one of those transactions, they found Sir Mitchell had withdrawn all the money. While there were physical similarities between the sisters, investigators believe they were distinct enough to identify the woman in the footage as Sarah and not Stevie. She was cashing checks that were issued to Stevie Allman that, uh, that she wasn't entitled to cash. There were other incidents that Sarah was posing as Stevie, I, I think attempts to try to get uh, retirement checks, and uh, uh, she was trying to do a, a total identity switch. To detectives, this can only mean one thing. My early suspicion on this was that she had killed Stevie. And because nobody would have somebody's identification and money like that uh, belonging to Stevie, unless Stevie wasn't around. On July 15, 1997, two weeks after the Allman home went up in flames, detectives secure a search warrant for the property. In 1997, I was uh, one of the senior crime scene investigators in our unit. The day I was asked to respond with the uh, investigators, I was told we were going there to look for a body. So we would search it from top to bottom and turn it inside out if we had to. While much of the home was destroyed, some items survived the fire. I entered the house and it was um, severely burnt. Um, you could smell the charred wood and the room was cold and very dark. There was no electricity. And as I walked in, um, they brought me with their flashlights and guided me to the kitchen area, which was just past the living room. Two of the investigators went into the kitchen and they walked over to the uh, freezer. And so using a flashlight, he opened the freezer and saw what looked like an elbow protruding out uh, from the garbage bag. I reached inside of the freezer box and I was able to grab a hold of what I believe was her arm and I tried to feel for a pulse but there was nothing. She was, she was deceased. It was clear that it was female but obviously it would take the coroner to do a, an actual identification. It wasn't confirmed yet, but it was my assumption that it was Stevie. The entire freezer is moved to the coroner's office for an autopsy. I was there as we untaped the freezer box, and then as uh, the body was removed, I think there was at least two bags. As they open the bags, authorities are met with a gruesome sight. It was at that point they determined that not only was she dead, but that she had also been dismembered. She had been cut in half from the waist up, and then the lower torso from her waist down to about above her knees, and then the last part that came out was the, the legs. We had four uh, body parts all together. It was just disbelief and just never seen anything like this before in my career this is what horror movies are made of frightening the damage to the head was the obvious cause of death seeing the results of the autopsy was that stevie allman died of blood trauma blood trauma to the head where she received numerous blows maybe as many as 20 blows likely with a crowbar but an instrument like that caused her to die because the remains had been well preserved, investigators feel confident with the preliminary identification of the body as Stevie Allman. Back at the home, CSIs look for clues amongst the wreckage to piece together how the crime unfolded. They uh, went into the front bedroom, which is the room 
that was Stevie Armand's bedroom. And they went in and placed the luminol on the floors and the walls, and the room lit up like a Christmas tree. So that confirmed that Stevie Armand had been murdered in that bedroom. Authorities find more grisly clues in the bathroom. I did see the tub that had the skill saw marks on the uh, the porcelain tub, which is where she had Stevie's legs draped over the side of the uh, the tub and cut the legs off. Despite the condition of the burned home, authorities are able to recover blood samples as well as several possible murder weapons. I can tell you there were quite a few things that uh, they asked me to recover. A skill saw, hammer, some knives. There was probably close to 40 pieces of evidence collected. On July 23rd, 1997, Sarah Mitchell is officially charged with the murder of her sister, Stevie Allman. We was totally shocked. We didn't realize we had a murderer right here in our own neighborhood. I mean, if she'd have killed her sister, she'd have killed me. She'd have killed you. She'd have killed anybody. Oakland detectives have arrested 47-year-old Sarah Mitchell for the impersonation and murder of her older sister, Stevie Allman. It was shocking to hear something like that would happen, especially right next door to me. We just felt duped, period. Everyone was angry uh, at that point because here you are a woman who had blamed the drug dealers for something so horrific that you yourself had done. In November of 2000, Sarah Mitchell's much-anticipated trial gets underway. I spent quite a bit of time establishing uh, the relationships between Sarah Mitchell and Stevie Amin so that the jury could understand how someone can do this to their own sister. We focused on the actual evidence in terms of who had access to Stevie Amin, that they could walk into her room at night and beat her to death. And then you close the case down with the motive. And in this case, it was a financial gain motive that was the reason behind this whole case. We focused on voluminous numbers of photographs of Sarah Mitchell in the bank withdrawing her sister's money. Prosecutors theorize that on the night of June 30th, 1997, while Stevie was sleeping, Sarah walked into her sister's bedroom with horrific intentions. According to prosecutors, she sneaks into her sister's bedroom in the middle of the night. She's armed. She begins bludgeoning Stevie's head and over and over again. Then she drags the body from the bed across the floor into the bathroom where she proceeds to cut her sister into pieces with a saw. I don't understand the mentality how a sister could kill another sister. It's such a, a dramatic and gruesome way. It's just, it's beyond me. I can't explain it. According to prosecutors, the evidence against Sarah is overwhelming. You show the jury what happened that night. What was the instrumentality that was used? The dismemberment of the body. The attempt to cover up the blood spatter that was all over the walls and the floor in the bedroom by firebombing the house from the inside and then claiming drug dealers through a Molotov cocktail. And then you show the jury the photo of the glass outside the house as opposed to inside the house. Ultimately, the state's case was enough to convince the jury. And on November 21st, 2000, Sarah Mitchell is found guilty of murder. I believe the ultimate verdict in finding her guilty was appropriate considering the evidence that was stacked up all around them and around her. She thought about it before she did it and she planned it and then she executed her plan and therefore they found that she premeditated the murder, which is first degree murder in California. At her sentencing hearing on December 4th, 2000, surprisingly, Sarah's family pleads for her life. They had been hurt enough and to take
take the life of the second sister would just be another stab in the heart. Her family, from what I understand, did not want the death penalty. And now she's left to live her life behind bars. Sometimes maybe death isn't really a punishment, but life behind bars is. Anyone in their right mind, right, would not think to do something so horrific if, you know, your sister is actually taking care of you, providing for you, has a home for you, and taking care of your every need. And then you turn around and this is how you repay them. At the end of the day, I think it just boils down to money, jealousy, pure just greed and evil. And though Stevie's life ended tragically, the crime will never overshadow her memory. She cared for her mother, she cared for her siblings. She was just a person of high integrity, hard worker. I mean, she represented all of the good things uh, in people. And I think her sister, Sarah, represented some of the worst things 